First of all, I appreciate all of you coming out um, today, and it's impressive to see the number of you out here to, um, again, to uh, deal with this problem that, that we're confronted with uh, each year. I've been asked to talk with you today about residual herbicides. What does it take to activate a residual herbicide? And I think one thing that's definitely obvious if you take after listening to Bob, listening to Ken, listening to our other speakers is, if you're going to manage Palmer amaranth long term, we have got to incorporate residual herbicides into our programs. And that's what you're going to see throughout my talk. When you take a look at Palmer amaranth, and we actually published some data back in 2006, Palmer amaranth can exhibit growth of more than two inches per day. Now again, I don't necessarily have a degree in mathematics, but simple math tells me within a seven day period, you have a pigweed that can be taller than 12 inches, taller than a foot. And I will tell you that I'm not aware of any product out there that is going to control a glyphosate resistant pigweed taller than 12 inches on a consistent basis. We don't have any. Therefore, we've got to have residual herbicides. We've heard this morning about the ALS resistant Palmer amaranth. I list some herbicides here again. Uh, Ken gave numbers 60, 70 percent in the state of Arkansas. I've seen some of the numbers out of Georgia. I think very comparable numbers over there in the southeast. This is a major problem. So again, the ALS chemistry is not going to be the solution for us post-emergence in cotton or in soybean. So cotton, if you have glyphosate resistant, ALS resistant pigweed in cotton, call Ken Smith. Don't call me because I don't have any options for you. There aren't any options. If you planted Roundup Ready cotton and you have ALS resistant pigweed and you have glyphosate resistant pigweed in that field, you're gonna send a whole crew through that field and that's the best option you have because there's nothing that you can do over the top to control that. And even as Bob indicated this morning in soybean, very, very limited options. You're talking about mainly Flexstar and they better be extremely small plants. This is a major problem. 2009, uh, Dr. Nichols, uh, we got together again several states, 1.6 million acres of cotton and soybean across the Mid-South, Southeast. I can guarantee you, as he indicated this morning, that number has increased. If you have pigweed on your farm, you had better assume it to be glyphosate resistant and put a residual herbicide down under your crop. You do not want to learn it after the fact. We've done some work over the past few years, and I have growers, growers that ask me, well, I don't have glyphosate-resistant pigweed, and if I were to try to uh, prevent it from occurring on my farm, and I wanted to use a residual herbicide, but I only wanted to use one, where would you use it? We've done some work, and if you are going to use a residual herbicide, you don't have glyphosate-resistant pigweed at this, stand, at this point, use it on the front end of the crop. The pigweed that emerges on the front end of the crop is the pigweed that's going to produce the most seed. It's going to be the pigweed that's most competitive with the crop. Well, what if you have glyphosate-resistant pigweed? Ken mentioned, overlay residual herbicides. Start with a good, sound residual program, and before that residual program breaks, you've got to come in with another residual herbicide. Reflex followed by maybe a uh, reflex in a, in a pre-plant uh, pre program in cotton, followed by maybe Cotteran Pre, dual. Ken gave the options. We all saw the options. We've got to overlay these residual herbicides, and the reason being is right here. Pigweed emerges throughout the growing season. It's not going to stop emerging in cotton or soybean until you get a very dense canopy. And because of the rapid growth, again, we can't get back in front of it. I want to share with you some data that we collected. This is data from Mariana uh, back in 2009. And this is Palmer amaranth or pigweed at four weeks after planting cotton. We had reflex that we put out two weeks prior to planting, and we've got several programs here. We've got Cotteran that we put out pre-emergence, and we looked at several programs. Prowl, pre-emergence, and we looked at several programs. Well, when we come back in at four weeks after planting, you see the ones where we had reflex two weeks prior to planting, we're at about 80 to 95% control. This averages about 90 across these programs here. 
Cotteran, by four weeks, had broken. We're at what? About 60% control. 60% control, I can tell you right now, guys, 60% control. You've got pigweeds in that field. They were six inches, eight inches by the time we were four weeks after planting. And you see Prowl. Prowl obviously broke uh, soon before the Cotteran did. So what were we going to then do at that point? Well, again, we put our programs out, we gave our cotton a little more time, and we began to post-direct. We eventually laid this cotton by with MSMA and Direx, and I'll tell you the problem was. We were trying to direct on, on pigweed that was 18 inches tall. You cannot direct on pigweed that's 18 inches tall. If your pre-emergence herbicide breaks and it's ALS resistant and glyphosate resistant, the point is, you cannot get back in front of it. Now what you see here with this program actually here, this reflex, we, have, we actually reflex followed by a one leaf dual. These programs were followed by a four leaf dual. We actually stayed in front of our pigweed. We stayed in front of the pigweed and at the end of the year we actually picked some cotton here. We could not run the picker through the field here. You could not put the picker in the field because of the pigweed. The point is we've got to focus on, again, overlaying residual herbicides and have very effective residual herbicides. You've heard the term activation today. We've heard several of these speakers have talked about activation. Well, I want to um, take a look at what really is activation because you're going to see this throughout my presentation. Activation is basically putting the herbicide on the soil surface and then moving it. This is a, basically, this is a, a a slice of soil, let's just say a, yeah, a slice of soil, zero to one inch, two inch, three inch, so forth. These are pigweed seed in the soil. You put the herbicide on the soil surface and you move the herbicide into the soil where it's essentially in contact or surrounding these pigweed seed that are in the soil. Well, how do we get it into the soil? There's two ways to get it into the soil. One is water. That water could be irrigation, that water could be uh, rainfall. How else can you get it in the soil? Incorporation. Now many of us, it's been 15, 20 years since we've tried incorporating a herbicide. It's not something we do on a common basis, but that's one way of activating a herbicide. Once we get the um, herbicide, and essentially I'm saying the herbicide is this yellow or orange, I'm sorry, this orange um, color here. Once you get the herbicide in, that herbicide can be taken up by these seed as they germinate and they kill the seedling. Herbicides do not kill weed seed. I want to repeat that. Residual herbicides do not kill weed seed. The weed seed must take up the herbicide, must germinate, and as they germinate and begin to grow, they're then active. Soil active herbicides must be in soil solution in order to have activity. If you have dry conditions and it's not in soil solution, it's not active. The weeds can emerge through this, and I'll actually illustrate that here in a few minutes. Activation is depending upon the timing of the rainfall, timing of the irrigation event. The longer you wait, the less activity you're going to have, and we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. The amount of rainfall or the amount of irrigation or, again, incorporation. It's also dependent upon herbicide selection. Not all herbicides are created equally. Herbicides differ. They differ in their characteristics. Volatilization, how much is going to come off of that soil? Photodegradation, how much is broken down by sunlight? How soluble they are in water? How they partition the soil? How mobile are they in soil? All of these factors influence the activation of that herbicide. Residual herbicides do not work if they are applied on a dry soil surface and they don't have rainfall. Again, because of the fact you're going to have volatilization, photodegradation, and you're not going to have the herbicide taken up as the seedling begins to germinate and grow. I saw Ford in here earlier, and Ford, I'm going to use one of your Delta Farm Press articles here. Um, Ford had written back in February of 2009, when to use soil residual herbicides. And again, it was a very good discussion of the use of soil residual herbicides, but I agree with Ford in that I think most of you sitting out here today, the very first question, and this is what Ford had said, the very first question someone usually asks when they choose to use a pre-emergence herbicide is, 
How long will it take or how long will it wait on rainfall? Because we know it's not going to sit there for an extended period of time based because of the characteristics that I just shared with you. It's not going to sit there for an extended period of time and remain active. He also goes on to say that growers should be realistic about what to expect from them. Do not lose sight of the fact that if soil residual herbicides were the answer to most weed problems, Roundup Ready would not have taken the market by storm in the mid-1990s. And I agree totally with what Ford has said here. The beauty of glyphosate or Roundup is glyphosate was consistent. Glyphosate, you sprayed glyphosate and you had the clean fields that Dr. Burgos was showing you earlier. Residual herbicides are not as consistent as what we're accustomed to with glyphosate. However, I will argue today that is what, was, what we're left with. And it's not that they're not consistent on a regular basis. This is some data that actually Ken Smith um, put together. We had some discussions here last year, and he went back to some uh, weather data and looked at Kaiser. This is 20-year Kaiser data, and I'm going to start with June. I'm going to show you a couple of months here, but I'm going to start with June. Most of you would agree in the state of Arkansas, June, is June, July, August begins to be some of our drier months. If we say that it's going to take a quarter of an inch of rainfall within 10 days to activate a herbicide, and this is just arbitrarily chosen here, 75% of the time, 75% of the time you will have an activated residual herbicide. Well, I want to back up. Let's rather than June, now let's back up into May. As we go back towards May, what we actually see is the likelihood of rainfall is greater. 80% of the time, four out of five times, you're going to have your residual herbicide activated. Most of us are planting in April late April in terms of cotton, our burn down, our reflex in cotton, where we're using reflex in our pre-plant burn down, we're putting it out in April, 85% likelihood of getting it activated at this site. Also, I think the beauty of, again, of having these April applications in terms of your burn down and your residual herbicides in your burn down, if you don't get them activated, we can come back in with a gramoxone, something at planting to try to clean up what few escapes that we have, and again, lay another residual herbicide down. I want to go back now and kind of revisit this no rainfall, non-incorporated scenario here. What I'm il illustrating here, the orange that you're seeing on top of the soil surface is the herbicide. It's been sprayed on the soil surface. We haven't had a rainfall. The blue here is actually soil moisture. If you don't have a rainfall on this, um, shortly after a uh, soil applied herbicide is sprayed, what you have is very dry conditions at the soil surface. But as you begin to go deeper and deeper in the soil, what do you see? More and more moisture. What actually happens here is at times we can put a soil applied herbicide on the soil surface and maybe down here at one inch, maybe even a half inch, we have enough soil moisture to essentially germinate a pigweed. Are we going to kill that pigweed with the residual herbicide? Absolutely not. The reason being is it hasn't moved into the zone in which it's germinating. At this point we have failure. When we have rainfall, or we incorporate it again uh, through mechanical means, we're going to have something like this. Top inch, two inches, we've moved the herbicide into that zone. The pigweed seed germinates. Pigweed seed takes up the herbicide. We have a de dead pigweed. What happens if you have too much rainfall? And at times in the spring, we will have too much rainfall. I'm going to illustrate also some other instances where we can have too much water. Too much rainfall. Essentially, we've moved that herbicide. We've removed it down to about three inches, four inches. This pigweed is beginning to germinate half an inch. Is that residual herbicide going to kill the pigweed? Absolutely not. There are instances in which we have too much rainfall. I want to go back and revisit this. What does it take to activate um, some herbicides? We initiated some work last winter, and we've just begun this and are hoping to uh, continue some of this and even expand it. Um, with the idea of again answering what does it take to, uh, to activate a residual herbicide for the control of pigweed. What you're seeing is here, you're seeing basically control of pigweed on the x-axis. What you're seeing down here are various herbicides. When you look at this, 
with the various herbicides you, hit, you see here, for the most part, if you put a half an inch of rainfall on this shortly after application, and this was actually immediately after application, you put a half an inch of rainfall on it, you've got an activated herbicide. It's able to kill, at least these herbicides here are able to provide residual control of pigweed. Once you get down to a quarter inch, just yellow here, if you have a quarter of an inch of rainfall, it's a lot less consistent and it definitely differs by herbicide. Sub-irrigation. If I were to ask how many of you in here sub-irrigate your crop, many of you would probably say that you don't, but in reality you do. Any of you that are fur irrigating a crop, if you're running water down a furrow and you put a pre-emergence or residual herbicide over the top of that bed, sub-irrigation, essentially water is going to wick to the top of that bed, and that wicking of water may actually activate the herbicide. And what we see here is some of these, for instance, dual, wicking of water up that bed actually can activate quite readily dual. A few other herbicides here. Staple. Wicking is not going to work on it. Wicking's not going to work on Invoke. Um, you see, again, about a half an inch is where we saw maximum activation here because one inch didn't improve. Reflex and Valor. These are two herbicides that what I've seen to this point, and I'm going to show you some additional data today, very easy to activate. Quarter of an inch of rainfall shortly after application activated these. You can see also um, sub-irrigation activated these herbicides. One question also I get is from, from growers and, and various other uh, distributors, individuals will ask, if I have herbicides that are very similar in chemistry, very similar in nature, do they behave similarly in terms of requirements for activation? This is some data actually that I pulled out of the University of Illinois. You see Simmons 1997, and no, it's not pigweed, but I think it still illustrates a very important point here. We've got three chloracetamide herbicides, Dual, Frontier, and Harness. Um, Harness is also um, acetochlor, which would be Warrant, Monsanto's new Warrant. When you take a look at these herbicides, they went out and they had absolutely no rainfall after, after application, and you saw 55% control, equivalent across these herbicides. 0.1 inch did not activate the herbicide. 0.25 did not fully activate the herbicide. But I think what's interesting here is, even though they are the same in the same chemistry here, you see differences in activation here. Harness is more active at a quarter of an inch than is dual. You see the same trend at a half an inch, and ultimately you see one inch was needed here on this soil. One inch was needed to fully activate uh, the herbicides. I went to the um, Weed Science Society of America's herbicide handbook yesterday and actually put this slide together. And the reason I put this together is, again, when you take a look at lose, how long can a herbicide remain active on the soil surface? That's partially dependent upon how quickly it's going to photodegrade or how quickly you're going to lose it due to volatility. When I take a look at these three herbicides up here at the top, and all three of these herbicides are very similar. Um, they're both um, PS, what we call PS2 herbicides. Cotteran. If cotteran lays on the, lies on the soil surface for a significant period of time, you're going to have loss due to photodegradation. You're not losing it because of, because of volatility. Direx. You can lose it because of volatility if you have hot, dry conditions. And this is directly, again, from the um, herbicide handbook. Caparol, negligible, and uh, low in terms of volatility and photodegradation. Well, let's look at the PPO herbicides. Reflex. Reflex is a great herbicide for the con residual control of, of pigweed, as well as um, early post. But it is sensitive to sig um, significant loss due to photodegradation. Valor, we really don't see much loss due to photodegradation or volatility, but if you do have standing water in a field you can have very, very rapid loss. Metolachlor, you can read significant loss here. Warrant or acetochlor would be negligible. Prowl, negligible loss as a result of photodegradation, moderate in terms of volatility. Treflan, Treflan, the reason we incorporated Treflan was because it was sensitive to volatility as well as photodegradation. If you did not incorporate it, you lost it. 
Pyrothyl back again, photodegradation. The point here is these herbicides differ considerably in how long they're going to lie on the soil surface uh, because of their chemical properties. That brings me now to a, a study that I did this past year over at, at uh, Mariana, and we were looking at residual control of Palmer amaranth. And this says weeks after planting, and actually that should say weeks after applying the herbicide. But you see the various herbicides that I have over here on the right-hand side. Valor, Reflex, Direx, Caparol, Pryol, H2O, and Invoke. We put out these herbicides, we came back and we rated them two weeks after treatment. And you see how basically over time the herbicides are declining in terms of their effectiveness of Palmer amaranth. At planting, one day after planting, I had a tenth of an inch of rain. Is a tenth of an inch of rain enough to activate a herbicide? I'll answer that now. The answer is no. Tenth of an inch is not going to fully activate a herbicide. At two weeks, we came in and we fur irrigated this trial. We did not have moisture on it prior to that. So these herbicides, for the most part, laid there two weeks prior to even seeing water. And that was fur irrigation. Well, as expected, you go out and you fur irrigate, and what happens the next day? You get rain. So we had a quarter of an inch the day following fur irrigation, and then we had two-tenths of an inch the day after that. But I think this really gives us some idea. If we take a look at Invoke, we take a look at Prowl, these herbicides, because they laid there for an extended period on the soil surface before we actually had an activation event here, we rapidly lost activity of these. As pointed out on the previous slide, Valor. Valor is extremely tolerant to photodegradation. You don't see much volatility. As a result of that, Valor carried a good bit of residual control out to about seven weeks. Reflex, um, you see it was slightly less, possibly because of the photodegradation. The point here is they're going to differ in their ability to carry residual, herbis, uh, residual control because of how they were activated here to some extent. How much, much moisture is too much moisture? Again, it's the same as with the rainfall. It's herbicide specific. It's, in, it's um, dependent upon the intensity of rainfall, the amount of rainfall. And then also I say here soil movement. A lot of our crops in the Mid-South, we fur irrigate. With fur irrigation, you will get some particles, some settle, uh, sediment movement in these furrows. With that, you will see an impact on the herbicide. And I'll give you an example here. This is a trial that we conducted at Kaiser up on a sharky clay soil uh, this past growing season. We took six herbicides, cotton herbicides, and we put them out um, over four, uh, four row plots, four beds, 500 feet long. After putting out the herbicides, we turn, turned on the fur irrigation. We came back seven days later and we fur irrigated again. Now, across those six herbicides, in the bottom of that furrow, at 14 days after putting out that herbicide, in the bottom of that furrow, we had 63% pigweed control. On the top of that furrow, we had 83% pigweed control. Now, this did slightly differ by herbicide, but the point is, guys, in the bottom of that furrow where we're running water, that herbicide's going to break. And it's going to break a lot sooner than it will on top of that bed. And you sit over and you look at this treatment to the right. This was actually the reflex, two weeks after treatment. You look at that. And if I were to ask a show of hands today, I'm sure most of you would raise your hand and tell me that plot's actually clean. And I would tell you that you're incorrect. Actually, I went in and circled the seedling pigweed. we got pigweeds in here that are one inch, two inch in size. Where do we see most of the pigweed? We're seeing most of the pigweed actually in the bottom of this furrow. I think there's nine pigweed in this little area that I took a photograph here. There's nine pigweed that's broke through here. There's only two pigweed that's broke through the top of that bed. The point is, when we turn the water on, and I understand we have to water, but once you turn the water on, you had better expect that that residual herbicide is going to begin to break in the bottom of that bed or in the, on the bottom of that furrow. I want to leave you with this picture right here. This is a photograph of, this is some work that I've, um, I've done over the past few years. Griff Griffith, one of my students, has actually been involved in this. This is some of his PhD work. And this is actually where a single Palmer amaranth has escaped control. And this is two years later. 
This is cotton. This is glyphosate-resistant pigweed. This is cotton that we've been spraying with Roundup, Roundup, Roundup. My question to you, can you afford not to use a residual herbicides in fields having Palmer amaranth? I will tell you, this field, this pasture, this field's about three acres in size, and we've got four of them. There's not a square foot in these fields, these three fields this year, three years after letting one glyphosate-resistant pigweed go to seed, there's not a single square foot in these fields where we do not have a glyphosate-resistant pigweed today. Guys, we've got to use residual herbicides if we're going to be effective in the long term in terms of managing this weed.